Uh, Mac test. If you hear anything, please to test something on chatbot. Uh, Mac test. If you hear anything, please tap something on chatbot. Uh, Mac test. If you hear anything, please type something on the chatbot. Um, thanks. Uh, okay, we will start our today's webinars now. On today's webinars, we, uh, we have a Singapore Banking Monthly, Raffles Me uh, Medical Group, Easy World Rates, um, uh, China Something, Asia PTV Trust, um, Shenzhong Group, US Weekly, China Weekly, and uh, our Philip Singapore Weeklies. <laughs> Um, okay, we will move to the Singapore monthly, uh, Singapore banking monthly first. Hi, so moving on to Singapore banking monthly. So for Singapore's loans growth year on year, in January, domestic loan grew around uh, 3.16. It's rather flat as compared to December's 3.04%. Um, loans growth is mainly held up by business loan growth uh, of 4.8% year on year, and this is due to building and construction loans. So these loans are actually due to the drawdowns of loans in the existing project, uh, projects in the pipeline. So for consumer loans, it weakened to a 0.82% uh, year on year, and this is due to mortgage weakness. So mortgage growth actually slowed to 1.6% year on year, and this is the slowest in 17 years. So due to the worsening uh, macroeconomic conditions, we expect that loan growth for the banks will slow to 4 to 6% for 2019 as compared to 7 to 11% in 2018. As you can see from the chart here, the domestic consumer loans is the one that is pulling the overall loan growth down, which is the red line for the consumer, and uh, business is the dark blue line here. So business is still upholding the overall loan growth for Singapore. So for the deposits growth in January, it grew around 4.8% year on year. And this is the fastest is one, in 1 1.5 years. And CASA contracted 1.1% year on year. So CASA is your current and savings accounts uh, deposits in the banks, which use the lowest uh, returns and interest rates for the clients and the customers. So for fixed deposit, it expanded 15.1% year on year. And this is as seen from the red line here. And this is the highest in 11 years. So the reason why it increased so fast in this uh, month and recently in the past year or so is due to a rising interest rate environment. So in a rising interest rate environment, we typically will see the banks uh, bulk out on their fixed deposits as well. And as the banks bulk out on a fixed deposit, we will see a corresponding rise in the cost of funds. So this makes it a challenge for the banks to manage their costs enough to achieve the net interest margin expansion. So for the interest rate of Singapore, February's three-month cyber reached 1.953, and this surpassed last month's 11-year high. So SOAR similarly expanded 10 basis points month-on-month, on month, while savings deposit rate, uh, the light blue line here, remained relatively uh, flat in Singapore. So due to the time lag in loan pricing that we know, like fixed rate 
loans take around years to reprice while floating rate which is the majority of the loans these days take around months to reprice so we will see a lag in the net interest margin expansion <laughs> so even if there's a pause in the federal rate hikes we will still see net interest margin expansion for the three banks in 2019 However, given the recent dovish term, tone set by the US Federal Reserve, we adjusted our expectations because we do not expect interest rates to rise as fast as it did in 2018. So if we reduced our FY19 interest margin estimate for all three banks by around 3%. So we still maintain the Singapore banking sector at overweight. So this is mainly due to higher net interest margins that we expect for 2019 and lower provisions due to benign credit quality and also better cost management by the banks and all these should provide upside to the ROE improvements in 2019 as well. And the banking sector gives an attractive dividend yield of around 5%. So at the moment, all three banks' CET1 ratios are, are, are at the same level and it should also sustain the current dividend payout ratios moving forward. So the key risk for the banks is that um, lower pass-through of interest rate into cyber and so lesser US federal rate hikes, and market volatility to continue to pressure the treasury market's revenue downwards. And also weaker sentiments due to trade tensions might affect the wealth management and investment banking even further. So now I'll move on to Raffles Medical who released the results last Monday. So for Raffles Medical, the positive in this quarter is the healthcare services. So over here, you can see that their revenue lines are in uh, many three areas. Healthcare services, which is from their GP clinics. Uh, hospital services is from the Raffles Hospital. And then when the Chongqing and Shanghai Hospital were to open, this will also flow into the hospital services uh, segment. And investment holdings comes uh, mainly from their lease space in Raffles Hospital. So over here, we saw that uh, the positive is the 6% uh, increase year on year for the healthcare services. And this is mainly due to new corporate clients added, as well as the new air border screening contract with MOH. So this resulted in the growth for healthcare. And the well-executed cost management is also the other positive. So staff costs managed to contract even though they expanded their facilities in Raffles Hospital as well as, as in, uh, and in China Chongqing. So staff costs made up 50% of revenue as compared to FY17's 52%. So as uh, they continue to expand into China, we expect staff costs to remain above 50% of the group's revenue in the coming quarters until patient volume picks up in the respective hospitals as well in China. The negative this time around for Raffles is the continued and sustained pressure for medical tourism. So the growth of patient load for Raffles have already stagnated. However, management is uh, quite confident that they're able to keep the foreign patient load at the current levels, even though growth might not be uh, that uh, possible. And this is mainly due to stronger SGD and the rising cost of living in Singapore, which made it uh, increasingly unattractive for foreign patients to seek treatment in Singapore, as well as uh, regional rivals, their yeah, capabilities has also increased. So regional rivals uh, refers to countries such as Vietnam, Indonesia, and Thailand. However, uh, management has also expressed that given the recent medical fee guideline in Singapore, it should provide more transparency and clarity to foreign patients regarding the cost and pricing of private healthcare in Singapore so that they won't assume that all private healthcare in Singapore are expensive. So for the overall outlook for Raffles Medical, uh, in China, there is the Chongqing and also Shanghai Hospital. So Chongqing has already conducted its soft launch in January 2019. And the official launch will probably be in the mid of 2019. And Shanghai Hospital will open in uh, the end of this year for Q19. And for both hospitals, our management has guided that there's an EBITDA loss of 8 to 10 million in the first year, 4 to 5 million in the second year, and Eventually, in the third year, the hospital should break even. So we initially modeled in a gestation cost into a FY18 EBITDA. However, due to the delayed recognition of gestation costs for the China hospitals, we 
lower our EBITDA estimates and uh, bring it back uh, backwards to FY19 and 20. So we lower our EBITDA estimates for FY19 and 20 by around 3%. So downgrade to neutral for Raffles Medical with a lower target price of $1.09, previous target price of $1.16. And this is mainly due to us trimming our FY19 to 20 EBITDA estimates by 3 to 5% to account for the delayed recognition of gestation costs. So potential re-rating catalysts will be stronger demand for an MOH partnership, as well as better than expected performance in the two China hospitals and maybe uh, faster, just faster um, break in the hospital will break even faster. So this is the comparables for Raffles Medical as compared to their peers. So moving on, I'll pass on to Natalie to talk about EC World. Hi, so today I'll talk about EC, EC World's FY18 results. EC World is an industrial REIT that has assets in China. There are port, logistics, and e-commerce assets in China. So all metrics, all, re all revenue metrics are up, with gross revenue increasing 5.3%. This is due to this is mainly due to the contributions from the newly acquired Wuhan Meilote asset in April 2018. Organic growth from built-in rental escalations and positive rental reversions on new leases signed. Uh, net property income and distributable income were also up 5.6 and 4% respectively. This led to a 2.6% increase in DPU. On the positive side, on the positive side, sorry, hold on. Hi, sorry. So, on the positive side, the Wuhan asset has performed well since acquisition. In the eight months, we saw we saw occupancy increase from sixty percent to eighty six percent. However, on the on the downside, um, the occupancy at Beigang has not shown much improvement over the last three point six years. Uh, it has only increased from fifty five percent to eighty four percent. Do note that this uh, asset at Beigang is actually under master lease, so there's still a rental. Uh, income hidden income support. Our outlook for 2019. All of EC World's master leased assets, which are the port at Chongxi, Chongxian, Beigang, and Fuheng Warehouse, which represent 70% of revenue, are up for renewal in at the end of the year. Uh, the sponsor, the manager, has started negotiations with the sponsor, uh, and the terms, the terms of the, the release. Are up for are up for approval by the shareholders at an EGM. If accepted, if accepted, the new leases will extend whale from two to four two years to four point eight years. We feel that the lease terms are favorable, and will most likely be accepted by shareholders. So we maintain a buy with higher target price for of eighty five cents due to change in rental assumptions and early lease renewals this quarter. Uh, this translates to a FY19 yield of 20.2% and at a price to NAV of 0.84 times, we feel that this is a good buy. Uh, next, I'll pass on the time to Wang Zhi, who will talk about SEM Corp Industries. Hello, it's Guanzi here. So next, I'll talk about Samcom Industries 4Q results update. Uh, we maintain our buy call with a slight higher target price of $3.75. So uh, in 4Q, uh, the positives are that the SGPL, now they rename as the SEIL Project 2, narrow the losses. Uh, that was because the spot spread uh, improve due to the lower co 
prices in 4Q. And also uh, recently they just announced that they received a letter of award to supply uh, 500 megawatt of power. This is a long-term PPA. So hopefully this year they will uh, finalize this deal. The negatives are that the whole Utilities India operation turned a net loss. This one, this was due to uh, multiple uh, factors and one of them was that the unit one of TPCIL, now they rename it as SEIL project one, shut down for, uh, for the equipment inspection. So um, this will be expected to resume the operation by end of this uh, uh, by end of February, and meanwhile, 4Q was the low wind season, so SGIL the green energy uh, segment uh, didn't contribute to the group, and also uh, the UK capacity market remains suspended. That means uh, the UK power uh, reserve. Uh, that they acquired last year uh, needed to find other market to trade their electricity and currently the electricity price in UK is depressed. And lastly, uh, the marine segment continue to drag the whole group's performance. So the outlook uh, for this year is that um, as I mentioned just now, hopefully uh, SGPL will secure the long-term PPA for the 500 megawatt this year. And also for the gas business, uh, Metro mentioned they will take advantage of the index arbitrage between the pipe natural gas and LNG. And meanwhile, the UK PR, the, for the UK PR management, um, will aim to uh, target the grid market uh, by upgrading the capacity, that means they will they by this they can sell the power uh, at a higher prices. And also, we do not expect uh, San Marine to turn around substantially this year because the uh, offshore and marine market uh, remain soft in the near term. Uh, next is the CNMC's uh, 4Q results update. We maintain our buy call with a higher target price of 31 cents. So the positives are that um, we do see the realization of the profit turnaround owing to the carbon in leach. Accordingly, the full year revenue hit a record high, 8% uh, jump from the previous peak in FI816. Uh, please uh, do bear in mind that the ASP, the gold prices actually dropped by 8% year on year last year. So that means uh, the ramp up of production uh, offset the drop in gold prices. And the negatives are that the dual primary listing in Hong Kong was rejected. Um, so as of now, the bot haven't the board has not decided whether to continue to proceed with the, I mean, whether to resubmit the application for the dual listing or abandon the plan. So uh, the total listing expenses was around 2 million US dollars. So the outlook for CNMC is quite upbeat. Uh, this year they have multiple expansion plans and for example, they will install one more hip leaching pack. This is a permanent leaching pack. Uh, the capex of it is around 3 million US dollars. So uh, once this uh, leaching pack uh, is completed, they can save the transportation cost by half. And also they will embark on the underlying underground mining uh, to improve the ore grade. And also they will uh, establish the, a new flotation facility to monetize other metals such as silver, zinc, and lead. And also the next one is about the uh, cost reduction measure. Uh, they will consider to install a power line to supply the 
uh, the energy to the CIL plant because um, as of now they are using the diesel as the main uh, energy supply and lastly they will consider to double the capacity of the CIL plant so right now the capacity of it was uh, 500 tons per day so next is the China Sun since uh, 4Q results update so we maintain our buy call with a lower target price of $1.55 so the positives are that um, the 10,000 tons of insoluble sulfur as well as the uh, TBBS production line have commenced uh, commercial production in November and January respectively so we expect that this year we will see the full uh, results contribution from these two new uh, production line so we expect that uh, we will see the 50% and 28% jump in each of these two products and meanwhile the company already declared a final dividend of 5.5 .5 cents for last year so based on the uh, earnings uh, we calculated the payout ratio it reached 21% uh, and the dividend yield of 4.4% as of uh, based on last closing price and this is the breakdown of the sales volume and the ASP so we can see that the ASP continue to decline in fourth Q that was mainly because the underlying raw material price uh, in partic uh, aniline in particular dropped so they adjusted their sales price as well so the outlook for China Sunsin is that we expect the GPM to decline a bit because uh, the lower prices will drive more market supply and also uh, the company uh, has a further capacity uh, expansion plan until 2020 so uh, we expect that another 20,000 tons of BBS, TBBS production line to be uh, completed by end of this year so in all we think that the business will remain healthy this year so next I will pass on to Edmund to talk about US All right, thank you, Guangzi. So right now, I'll cover the US sweetly. So I'll start off by the macro last week. So in his testimony to the Congress, the Fed Chairman Powell uh, announced that they're going to announce the plans to end their round off, round off of their portfolio of bonds. He also warns of uh, slower economic growth, and patience is still his password, in the sense that he's not going to raise uh, interest rates anytime soon. In terms of GDP growth, uh, it was 2.6% as compared to the consensus of 2.2% in Q4 2018. As for the University of Michigan's uh, Consumer Sentiment Index, it was better than expected as it rose from 91.2 in January to 93.8 in February. As for, the, as for inflation, uh, the core PCE, which is one of the key indicators, key inflation indicators that the Fed uh, looked at, uh, it was lower than expected and it grew 1.7%. And this is partially due to the personal income tax cuts. In terms of corporate news, Berkshire Hathaway reported better than expected quarterly adjusted EPS, but revenue fell 52%. Uh, this is mainly due to the loss uh, which is contributed by Kraft Heinz where 
which uh, reported 15 billion of, uh, which wrote down 15 billion of its brand equity. As for Square, it had better than reported, uh, it had better than expected EPS and revenue, and its revenue was up 64.2%. It gave a light guidance for Q1 to be around 2.22 to 2.25 billion as compared to the previous guidance of 2.25 billion. And the, cons the guidance for EPS was 76 cents. But they, as they reported uh, very good numbers for its subscription and services revenue, which grew by 146%, its adjusted EBITDA also grew by 98%, uh, which suggests that Square is uh, currently growing at a very fast rate despite the recent uh, light guidance. For the week ahead, some of the key indicators to be released will be the new home sales, the balance of trade, the initial jobless claims, and the non-farm payrolls. These are the list of companies that are releasing their earnings results for March. So I'll give a brief summary of the quarterly earnings update for 4Q 2018. So we tried a list of 100 companies that represent at least 60% of the total equity market. So for the firms of, so we tried the firms of each sector that beat EPS expectations and the ones, the sectors that top the results would be the energy, consumer discretionary and healthcare. As for the firms that beat revenue expectations, the sectors the, that top the charts would be the consumer discretionary, real estate and industries, industrials. In terms of revenue growth, it is currently moderating for most of the sectors except for the defensive ones, such as consumer staples, communication services and utilities. As for valuations, most of the companies uh, in the energy sector beat the EPS expectations. The sector is currently uh, trading at 16.3 times earnings, which is below its historical average. The same goes for industrials. The sector is currently, currently trading at 17.6 times earnings, which is also, also below its historical average. So in summary, uh, our tactical view is, is that we pre our preferred sectors would be energy and industrials due to their uh, lower than average PE ratio and their revenue and their robust revenue growth. So right now I'll pass on my time to Jie Yuan who will talk more about the China weekly. Thanks, Edmund. For China last week, the headline is uh, two. Um, the two headline news is uh, there is a two headline news. One is the two sessions the meeting started from the on Mon on Sunday last Sundays and they will last for ten days. Um, this meetings were set to defend uh, economic goals for China economic, uh, especially for the GDP growth from 2019. The other uh, headline news is MSCI will increase the weight of the China issues in MSCI index. I will um, give the brief summaries the latest. For economic indicators, the, we, uh, we see the China February and uh, Taiwan manufacturing PMI is a bit expectations. Um, followed by our last week's the um, views, which is the liquidity problems have been easing, so the which have already boosted the small business the confidence. For the stock, recommenda stock recommendations, our Hong Kong research teams recommend uh, Heng An and uh, anti-stock spots. Heng An is a tissue, um, tissue business company based on Hong Kong's, and for, the, for its annual report, uh, it shows that the market shares continue to increase. Um, our Hong Kong research teams to set the target P ratios to 18.4 times um, uh, and uh, give the um, buy recommendations. 
for MSCI, China Asia is the increased weight. Um, China is, uh, MSCI said it, it will increase the um, inclusion weight from the 5% to 20% in three steps. The first step is the 2019 May, second step is uh, will be implanted on 2019 August, and the third steps will be implanted on November. Of which the of which two thousand uh, of which the two hundred and fifteen three the shares, um, non uh, non bank finance shares accounted for over twelve percent. Uh, this is a list of the all Hong Kong research um, teams' the stock recommendations. We add uh, Heng An and and stop uh, this week. Um, um, because Paul is not around, uh, um, we will skip the Asian Pay TV Trust and the uh, Shenzong. Uh, if there are any questions. Hi, thank you for the question on EC World. Uh, for the EC World, they have seven properties. Uh, two of them are not at 100% occupancy. They are Beigang and Wuhan, Wuhan Asset. So for the Wuhan Asset, uh, as mentioned, it was acquired only this year in April. Um, we still expect some sort of upside when as the, as the occupancy reaches 100%. For, for, for Beigang, it's actually under... Um, master lease. The so for master lease, right? It's a hundred. The the committed occupancy is hundred percent, but the physical occupancy is only at eighty eight. So the rental support is for the difference of eh, sorry eighty six. So the difference is for sixteen sixteen about sixteen percent of occupancy. Uh, the rental the rental support will actually end when the master lease ends. But as mentioned, there are the the negotiations with the sponsor to extend the master lease for four years uh, have been successful. This is pending, the outcome is actually pending a uh, shareholder vote. So if this is successful, this master lease for Beigang as well as the two other assets will be increased to four years, starting starting from the first of 20, the first January of 2020. I hope that answers your question. Okay, uh, there is a question asking about why the target price for Samco industry raised from $2.61 to $3.75 when the negatives and outlook seem weak. Uh, $2.61 was not our previous target price. It was the last closing price. And the uh, last uh, target price was $3.68 if I'm not wrong, roughly, uh, uh, yeah. So why we raised our target price was because uh, we also raised the uh, target price for Sam Corp Marine.
from one dollar and sixty five cents to one dollar and seventy eight cents, and also we do see a turnaround in uh India operation because the inspection for SGP STPCIL Unit One uh was one off event was an was an one off event. So right now, the Unit One has resumed the operations. So uh, the revenue from this uh, project was quite steady. And also the SGIL was impacted by the seasonality. So if we look at the full year uh, revenue contribution, SGIL is also improving. So the only catalyst we are looking forward to is the long-term PPA for SGPL, which we think that uh, same industry has a higher uh, probability that they can secure because they uh, prove that uh, they can secure the coal, which is the main feedstock uh, supply to the, uh, to the plant. And also the UK PR reserve, uh, it will um, also improve uh, this year because uh, the management is working on the uh, on the solutions on the um, operations of the current uh, situation. And for China and Singapore, these two markets uh, have. Has have the track record uh, to operate uh, steadily, so we expect that this year, uh, it wouldn't have uh, any other uh, substantial issues on that side. Thank you. Uh, we uh, we have another question asking about any target price for gear, uh, golden energy, and resources, uh, because they just announced their results uh, last Friday. So this afternoon they will hold a results briefing, which I will attend soon. So uh, we'll give uh, an update after that. So uh, please wait for our reports. Thank you. So uh, another client asked us to put the Xinjiang slides on the screen. So this is the uh, our slides.
Um, for the questions of the which ETF will benefit from the MSCI news, China's in policy include China issues. Uh, with, um, because the China issues uh, will be included in MSCI in next uh, in this year's and uh, after fully conclusions is um, it will represent for um, 3.3 percent. Uh, uh, we recommend uh, the ETF for checking the uh, MSCI Emerging Market Index. Or um, for for the details, we will um, be we will issue a report about this uh, later in this uh, in, later in this week. Thank you. Um, this one is a uh, Asian PT, um, pay TV slice. Hi, there was a question about uh, any REITs to look at in, specific, in, in particular. So for our calls, uh, EC World is a buy. And for our Accumulate calls, we have Capital Land Retail China, uh, Dasin, 
Capital Land Commercial Trust, Ascenders REIT, which is the industrial REIT, Capital DC. For our neutral calls, we have Capital, Capital Land Mall Trust, Fraser Centerpoint Trust, Maple Tree Industrial Trust, and Cash Logistics. Uh, so our, our sector, our, our subsector calls are actually for hospitality and uh, commercial, which is office. Thanks. Hi, so there's a question on whether uh, we should short the US consumer discretionary sector. So the short answer is no. So if you look at uh, this chart on the screen on uh, the firms that beat the EPS expectations, 88% uh, of those uh, large cap firms has beat the EPS expectation, which is very high. As for revenue, uh, it is 88%. And if you look at the revenue growth, it's currently growing at 14%, although there is a downward momentum. So uh, I don't think that we should currently, uh, I don't think that currently uh, we should shop the discretionary, consumer discretionary sector because uh, the fundamentals are still quite strong. But in terms of uh, individual companies, then we will need to see which company uh, that that uh, you want uh, that you are currently looking at. And just to add on, uh, because the consumer discretionary sector is uh, a very cyclical sector, so it really depends on the how the economy is currently doing. So if you look at the macro, uh, the GDP growth rate is currently uh, better than expected. Uh, inflation is low. Unemployment rate is uh, within uh, the Fed's expectations. So we would believe that there is still growth for the discretionary sector and uh, if you're looking for sectors that you want to short, maybe the material sector could be one of your considerations. Because uh, currently, yeah, so uh, you can look at the material sector because currently the PE ratio is uh, above average. Hi, so uh, there's another question on uh, on how is Kraft Heinz doing. So uh, it meets its EPS and revenue expectations and there was a 15 billion write down on its brand equity. So without looking at, without further information from the firm, uh, we would feel that perhaps now is not the right time to enter Kraft Heinz because uh, it is, it is difficult to uh, to analyze to see whether 
Craft Heinz is able to maintain its brand, brand equity uh, in at least for this year and at least for this year. Uh, 